I'm going to share my screen now and show a, a three minute video. This is just sort of like my, these are my other virtual guest speakers. And you might've seen this in an email that I've sent out um, this little uh, set of video clips. I interviewed some other court interpreters last week and asked them, what is it that you love about court interpreting? And I think uh, as we watch this, you'll see some uh, commonalities in what draws people to this profession. Court interpreters, in a nutshell, are bilingual people who learned how to listen in one language and then speak the same idea in another language in legal settings. It's got to be the greatest job in the world. We get to help people who really need it and appreciate it because we open up the doors of the justice system to them. And at the same time, it's an adventure, a series of mental puzzles to solve. Language is so fascinating to me, how I can sit between two people that are both making perfect sense talking to me, but who can't understand each other at all. And because I've got this superpower of transforming words back and forth in real time, they're able to communicate in ways that even the most advanced computers can't match. I've met some great friends in this profession, and so I called some of them to ask, what do you love about being a court interpreter? Uh, what I love most about my job is that I'm able to help with the language barrier. I love court interpreting because I get to work with very interesting people. So what I love the most about court interpreting is that you never stop learning, no matter how much you think you know. Uh, you learn court terms, slang from all the different countries, depending on the languages. In a career that can give you a decent way to have freedom, enough to live, and a schedule you know you can make on your own, um, I think is a privilege. And I really enjoy being a court interpreter for all those reasons. Uh, well, and there's so many things that I love, but the one that comes to mind first is every time I finish a job, I feel great. I feel, my brain feels great. So I love being able to help people who don't speak English communicate with the courts and make themselves heard and find out what is going on. A lot of times you end up learning a lot of other subjects and a lot of other things because uh, you, in the course of doing it, you end up interpreting for experts or for uh, expert witnesses. Usually after I'm done, they really thank me. They tell me that I made them feel very comfortable. So I like that, that I'm helping people. I love being a court interpreter because um, of the freedom that self-employment gives you. you. Get to set your own schedule is very nice. And it's also a life of constant learning and constant stimulation. This job is working with people. And uh, being a professional core interpreter, uh, you're capable of connecting uh, people to, to, together through language. Being willing to travel has brought me in California, for example, to some of the most beautiful places and introduced me to some of the most brilliant minds kind-hearted and hard-working people that I've met. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, let me make that go away. <laughs> it's queued up whatever the next video is. All right, so Lorena, um, if somebody were to ask you, what do you love about court interpreting? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Um, I love breaking the language barrier and I love being the voice of attorneys, the voice of judges and mostly voice of defendants in the, in the criminal justice system because I work mostly in criminal court. So do you find personal satisfaction in what you do? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And although it's, it would seem that the interpreters are the bottom of the food chain in the court system, we're not because nothing can be done without us, right? If uh, if the LEP doesn't, that's what we call limited English proficient LEPs. If the LEP does, does not speak the language, then we become the superheroes, right? Yeah. I remember a judge asking me one time how much I made how much I was getting paid. And when I told him, he got mad. He said, that's more than I'm getting paid. And I'm like, well, <laughs> sorry. You need to renegotiate your salary, dude. <laughs> yes.
<laughs> so it, it, you don't you don't always get paid more than judges, and it it depends whether you're staff or freelance. I'm a freelancer now. I used to be staff. Lorena used to be a freelancer and is now staff. And so the the pay scale is all over the place. But there are a lot of places uh, like in Texas. Most the court interpreters get over a hundred dollars an hour if they're freelancing and they're working for uh, law firms. Um, most of them get about uh, between fifty and eighty eighty dollars an hour if they're working for a uh, court system. And then maybe if they're a full-time staff interpreter, it works out to be less per hour, but there's more hours per week and there's benefits. So um, there's all different uh, pay scales, but it, it, it does pay well in general overall around the country. So I'm going to move my PowerPoint over here and we're gonna look through some slides. Um, I'm gonna share again. Hey, the little zoom icon has changed. Share screen. And if you can't see my PowerPoint, let me know. That means I'm doing something wrong. You should see a blue screen now. And how to earn $100 an hour as a court interpreter. Now, I feel a little clickbaity putting a dollar figure. I know it's tacky to talk about money, um, but I, I want you to know that this is a well-paying job. And in terms of the language-related jobs, translation, interpretation, court interpreting is pretty near the top of the specialties within this profession. and um, my rates are $400 for half a day or $800 for a full day. And if you work, say, a two-week trial, that's 10 days at $800 a day. And you can do the math. Um, that's good money. And if for languages other than Spanish, sometimes they're able to charge a higher rate because they are harder to find. Um, but then they may not have as, as much demand. And so they have to scramble more to find the jobs. Lorena and I both do Spanish. Lorena does French as well. Um, but we'll be focusing on the Spanish market today, though 95% of everything we say will apply to you if you work in a language other than Spanish. So court interpreting is bilingual people converting between spoken languages so that other people can communicate in a nutshell. We work in court at law firms and other legal settings. Um, often we can make $1,000 a day, um, but we don't work every day as freelancers. It depends on uh, who your clients are and when they need you. And we generally work for many clients back and forth. Um, technology is impacting the way we do this job, but not as much as it is for translators. Translators work with written language because um, spoken language is a lot more complex than written language. And um, it takes the human brain to really understand the social context in which people are communicating. And so it, no one can predict the future, but I see the job of court interpreting lasting at least for my lifetime, that there will still be humans needed in that context. And also the judicial system is slow to adopt technology. It likes to do things the old fashioned way, which is in our favor as human interpreters. Um, the, the good thing about this job is that AI still can't understand us. It doesn't know what we're talking about. These are written examples of human speech. But on the left, we have handwriting, bad handwriting, bad, bad spelling. A computer would not um, know what it means if they read or if they heard, I promise to be true to the American flag and to the country it stands for, a country that can't be divided where everyone gets freedom and fairness. A human can figure out, oh, that's the Pledge of Allegiance, just sort of uh, paraphrased in simpler language. Um, but to a computer, that'd be absolute nonsense. On the right, we have a text that has a lot of emojis in there. Um, as a human, I can figure out pretty much what it means. Um, uh, if a computer were trying to make sense of that, it would just be stumped. And so um, take advantage of the fact that you have a human brain. It is a more powerful uh, computer than anything that Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates owns or Elon Musk. So this was a recent survey. It's still underway of Texas court interpreters. Uh, how much should they charge? And the majority are in the purple, uh, charging $101 to $120 an hour. A lot of them are charging $121 to $140 an hour, some over $140 an hour. And so that is a lucrative income by my standards. Uh, we also asked, if you're a freelancer, how busy are you staying right now in October and November of 2022? And most of them in the blue say, I stay busy interpreting and I turn down assignments frequently. I know personally, I get offered a lot more jobs as a Spanish freelance interpreter in Texas than I can handle. And so I pass them along to friends of mine. I refer them and then when they're busy, they refer work back to me. The red section here, 37%, I have enough assignments to fit my lifestyle. 
And that's because a lot of interpreters don't want to work 40 hours a week. They want to have a part-time job because they're doing something else or they're raising small children or they are semi-retired. And so they just want a couple of gigs a week and they have that much work available. So in the red and the blue category, you can see that overall, and this is for Spanish and several other languages in the Texas market, um, there's plenty of work for interpreters. The steps in general to become a court interpreter, and this is a, sort of an oversimplification, but first you have to learn your second language really well. Then you have to learn how to interpret. Uh, then you have to pass the state tests. And then you have to market your services. And um, I'm going to tell you what it's like for a freelancer, and then I'm going to ask Lorena what it's like from the staff full-time employee perspective. Um, for me, marketing my services means uh, introducing myself to different kinds of people that hire interpreters, like within the courthouse or somebody who's in charge of the interpreter for each courtroom, um, introducing myself to court reporting agencies, um, the ones who send out the little stenographer who's typing everything that's said. They often uh, market the services of the interpreter as well, and also um, communicating with uh, colleagues and um, establishing informal networks like where we text each other. We have text threads going saying, hey, I got a deposition for tomorrow at 10. I can't take it. Who wants it? That kind of thing. Um, Stephanie, I don't know what the market's like in Oregon, um, but I am trying to uh, keep this in generalities, and it would be good for you to meet some Oregon court interpreters and find out what it's like right there. I haven't surveyed that market. Uh, Lorena, can you tell me how being a staff interpreter has been different for you from being a freelancer? Um, well, it's different. You kind of pigeonhole yourself into just one area of expertise. So I just interpret in federal court, for example. Um, you know, when I was a freelancer, I really enjoyed the variety, um, the flexibility, but at the same time, switching to a staff interpreter position. Now I um, I have a, you know, an a eight to five job. So a little bit more stability in terms of my schedule and where I'm going to be and what I'm going to do. And also, of course, you know, the steady spit, the steady paycheck and the benefits and the possibility of a pension down the road. Um, so those are things that drew, drew me into um, working as a staff interpreter. And when people ask me, uh, would you go back to being a freelancer? Yes, perhaps. I miss it. Uh, it was fun. It was exciting. But to me, a big aspect also of being um, a staff interpreter um, in the federal or, or the state courts, because I was in the state courts before, is I just like being a public servant. And that's a big part. As a staff interpreter, I, I become an officer of the court and um, a public servant. So I enjoy that aspect of it, too. Okay, thank you. Um, next slide here. So now we're going to look at the four steps um, from that last slide. And the first of them is learn a second language. Probably everyone on this call is bilingual or trilingual or multilingual. Um, but probably you have a dominant language that you're really good at and a college degree maybe in a country that that uh, was uh, studied in that language. And then your second language, maybe you know it more colloquially, you learned it in a family setting or you learned it from living abroad. And your second, uh, your weaker language, maybe you couldn't uh, get up on stage and speak extemporaneously to an audience in that language, or you couldn't carry on a high level conversation with an attorney on legal topics in that language. So if you have a weaker language, if you're, if you're equally bilingual, that's great. You don't have to worry about this. But if you have a weaker language, you probably wanna beef that up. You want to uh, take a college class in that language. You want to um, read on a daily basis, read the news or read um, college level books in that second language so that you can um, feel comfortable and that you can speak it fluently and that you don't have to hem and haw and try to come up with the right word. This might involve getting a position teaching that weaker language. For me, I learned Spanish and then I became a Spanish teacher and that forced me to really dig in deep and, and get all the details right, you know, where to put the accent marks in Spanish and where the stress falls on each syllable. And I can now explain you those rules that I would that I don't know about my native language of English because I learned English from my mom when I was three years old and I don't remember learning that and we didn't have to talk about all the grammar but with Spanish I had to I had to learn it from from the ground up and so the good news is you don't have to be a native speaker it doesn't matter what your native language is maybe it's English maybe it's Spanish maybe it's something else it doesn't matter you just have to learn your second language well and you can learn it as an adult I didn't start learning Spanish really seriously until my early 20s and so I had to work hard to catch up. And if you hear me speak Spanish now, you can tell it's not my native language. I make mistakes, but I get um, most of it right most of the time. And to pass the test, you don't have to do anything perfectly. You just have to get most of it right most of the time. 
You don't have to know every word. English has a million words now, and an educated native speaker only knows between 20 and 40,000. So nobody knows even half of the words in English, much less all of them. And, but you do have to be able to speak clearly and accurately and fluently and understandably. And like if Spanish is your other language, for example, you have to have some familiarity with the Mexican accent versus the Cuban accent versus the Argentine accent versus the Spaniard. You have to be able to understand what people are saying, even if they're not from your part of the world speaking your, uh, your favorite dialect. Um, can you tell me, Lorena, uh, when you're in court, do you have uh, people from different Spanish speaking and French speaking countries that you have to work with and you have to um, learn new accents? Absolutely, absolutely. In Spanish, uh, of course, like the Cuban accent uh, was very different from a Venezuelan accent, a Mexican accent. Uh, the, the terminology that they use sometimes is very different. And in French, if, if it's uh, um, French from uh, French speakers from African countries, um, the, the accent is also completely different. So yes, you have to be able to um, kind of get a grasp of the accents and understand the different uh, idioms that they might use um, and understand the accent. So yeah. But but you can't know all of them, right? You can't know every expression in every country, can you? No, you cannot. You cannot. And that's why, um, you know, you have to be humble and ask for clarification. If uh, your defendant or your witness has, you know, said something that you have absolutely no idea what it means. Um, good example of that, just last week, uh, um, the defendant from Dominican Republic said, el tigre, el tigre. Well, he, he wasn't talking about a tiger per se, right? We don't interpret word for word, we interpret meanings. So what he meant by tiger was he's a cool cat. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, and, and I don't think in Mexico, we use tigre as a cool cat that much. You, you would use some other term, right? So yeah, yeah. You, if you don't know it all, you ask and then you learn, which is what makes this profession so exciting. Every day you learn new words and new expressions. Right. But I remember at first I was nervous. What am I going to do if I don't know a word? Like if there's one word that stumps me, how am I going to handle it? And and with time, you you work through that. You you realize that I can usually understand it from the context. And if not, it's OK to stop and ask for clarification. And then every time you go into court, you're better prepared than you were before. So after you learn your second language well, the next major phase of this journey is learning how to interpret. Not interpreting in court, but just interpreting in general, interpreting between any two people who are speaking your two languages. You can practice it on your own. There are lots of self-study materials. Uh, you can volunteer in settings like CASA, which Lorena mentioned, and there's lots of other nonprofits that serve immigrant communities where you can volunteer to interpret for doctor's interviews or social services interviews or school meetings, parent-teacher conferences all kinds of settings that need an interpreter that can't afford to hire a hundred dollar an hour interpreter where you can uh, develop your skills and help people in the process. Whatever your job is, maybe you are hired because you're the only bilingual person in the office. And so they put you in charge of talking to all of the people from that language who come in and that's really great practice. And I hope you'll make the most of it by trying to build your vocabulary and learn new words each conversation that you have. And as you're practicing interpreting, your speed gets better, your vocabulary gets richer. You're able to say not just one word for a thing, but five different synonyms for this thing and start to get a feel for how those five different synonyms are slightly different. You learn more slang, you hear more dialects, and you're able to, if not speak in that dialect, at least understand it and convert it into, the, into your, your other language. And through this interpreting practice, you're kind of rewiring your brain, you're growing new connections and strengthening certain areas that that maybe weren't as strong before like active listening being able to focus think of the way a cat watches a laser beam when you're playing with your cat and how focused it is on pouncing on that laser beam that's the kind of focus an interpreter has listening to every word that's coming out of a person's uh, mouth and then concentrating and using your short-term memory and your medium-term memory and your long-term memory in really powerful ways to be able to hold a whole idea in your head and then scramble it up in the other language and spit it back out while you're still listening to the new sentence coming in. And it's just, it's like a muscle. The brain isn't technically a muscle, but it is analogous to a muscle in the fact that the more you train it, the more powerful it is. And um, Lorena, I know that you're an athletic person. You train for races and competitions and mountain climbings and wrestling tigers and who knows what all. But have you found that your interpreter training was sort of like training for an athletic event? 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The, you know, uh, when I train for marathons or mountain climbing, um, you know, you start the beginning of the season and you, you know, you're, you're running five miles hurts and then you next day you run seven and it gets a little better and so on. Interpreting is the exact same way. First time you attempt to do a three minute simultaneous, ex simultaneous exercise, by the end of those three minutes, your brain is tired right mental yeah. fatigue is huge but then you do it again and you practice and you practice and you practice and next thing you know you know you are you're not you know you're you're being very accurate your speed gets better your vocabulary gets better so yes the 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 the, mus the brain even though like you said marco is not a muscle per se it works as a muscle and repetition and practice is what really um helps in in both simultaneous and consecutive modes so Lorena, if you, let's say I'm using YouTube and watching a video of a court hearing and I'm practicing interpreting on my own, if I go through the whole video and practice interpreting the whole thing, is it then useless or should I go back and try that same video again and try to do it better the next time? Oh, I think you should definitely repeat it and do it um, as, as, and, and then the a big key that I think a lot of um, aspiring interpreters don't do is record yourself, record yourself and listen to that recording later, because sometimes you're so focused on the act of listening at the moment that when you're done, you don't even remember what you said. <laughs> and, uh, and then when you go back and listen to that recording, you're like, well, I knew that word. Why, how, why did I either skip it or forgot about it or whatever? So that's a big key. Um, you know, what I, you know, what I do sometimes, even nowadays, especially when I haven't practiced uh, French in, in a long time or haven't had a case in French, I go back and listen to, you know, TV France, the French TV, and I interpret, you know, I sit down and listen to the news and record myself, right? And then and then listen to that recording. And I'm like, oops, oops I should have known that word. I should have known that word. Yeah. So yeah, you, you, you can always constantly be practicing and getting better. Okay, thank you. And so as you're learning to interpret, you'll encounter some puzzles some linguistic puzzles like this, and I just made these up here on the spur of the moment. But think about if you're a Spanish speaker or whatever your other language is, how would you say in your other language, put the pedal to the metal? And if you have an idea, you can type it in the chat. Um, probably it won't be mentioning pedal or metal. There's probably some other expression for that. Um, but these are uh, things that if you think through them in advance and you've encountered them before, you might have some cute figure of speech ready to go. And if not, and you can just sort of explain it, uh, say the meaning in the other language. So here we have some suggestions in the chat. Echele ganas, acelerar a fondo. Good, good. Thank you. Um, how about uh, this kind of uh, challenge comes up sometimes in family court or, or in any court. Did you say he's your attorney or your lawyer? In English, attorney and lawyer are sort of two different registers. Uh, attorney is a more formal and polite word. Lawyer is a little bit more colloquial. Um, and in Spanish, there are different words for lawyer too. In different countries, there's different terms that are that are favored, but I don't feel like there's the same um, distinction, an exact equivalent between the level of formality for attorney versus lawyer. And so if, if this question were asking me in English and I were trying to repeat it in Spanish, I'd have a hard time figuring out, like, is the English speaker asking because the previous interpreter used the word attorney versus lawyer or because this Spanish speaker used the English word or because there were two different levels of Spanish word that he used? It's just sort of a, a puzzle because the, the synonyms don't have a direct equivalent between the languages. It's kind of like licencia versus abogado. Um, yeah, counselor. How is counselor more like attorney or more like lawyer? I feel like counselor is, it is more formal, maybe even more, more formal than attorney, um, but they're all uh, similar. Licenciado, abogado. Um, that would that that captures some of the feel, but it's just not an exact equivalent. So if somebody asks, admit that she bore you a child, and I interpret that into Spanish, admit that she bore you an hijo or a niño, then I'm asking, admit that she bore you a son. Um, if I want to imply that it could be a son or a daughter, then I have to use hijo o hija, niño o niña. But if I say, admit that she bore you an hijo, and the witness is thinking, she didn't bear me an hijo, she bore me an hija. And he would say, no, no, that's not true. And then I interpret that back. All of the English speakers in the room think that he has just denied that she bore him a son when actually she, uh, a child, when actually he was denying the gender that I claimed was born. And so there's this confusion that creeps in because it's not an exact equivalent back and forth that the interpreter has to sort of think big picture, think contextually, think ahead to the next step. How am I going to avoid these possible confusions? And how can I render it in a way that will not create that confusion? 
Um, different ways you can handle that. We're not going to get into all of the, the examples right now. But going back from Spanish and English, some, some uh, uh, that I've heard, uh, if somebody says mi comadre, comadre is technically the mother of your godchild, but this might be a woman who has no children and has never been to church and there are no godmothers involved and she just means comadre colloquially, meaning a good friend of hers. And so if I interpret that as the mother of my godchild, I'm probably being over specific for the context. Um, and so, and this is the kind of thing that a bilingual attorney could jump in and say, oh, but he didn't, she didn't say my good friend, she said the mother of my godchild, and then the interpreter would have to stand up and explain, yes, that's what it means, that's what the denotation is, but the connotation, the pragmatic meaning in context is not that specific. Uh, me puso el ojo refers to a cultural tradition of the evil eye that is common in Spanish-speaking countries and not in the U.S., um, a slang term that's kind of profane, like chingadera, is hard to render into English. You want to uh, convey the idea of a thing, the sort of a generic thing that I can't remember the name of, but you want to use kind of an offensive term to do that. And Lorena and I were talking about this this week. Uh, Lorena, en español, digo en inglés, ¿cómo dirías tú, onta esa chingadera? Uh, what, you know, where's that shit? You know, you can so use Lorena that. would say, where's that shit? <laughs> Where's so, that shit? Or what's up with that thing? shit? <laughs> where's that shitty thing? Yeah, because, that shitty thing. Yeah. Because chingadera is uh, sort of a mid-level profanity in Spanish. And so we want to convey that it's not super offensive, but it's not polite either. And yet, depending on where the listener is from and what they understand about the original context, you want to be as close to the original level of offensiveness as you can. And with profanity, that's famously difficult to do be between languages just because of their their cultural uh, embedding. So these are examples of the puzzles that interpreters solve all day long. One of the things that makes the job so intellectually stimulating. Um, we have a suggestion from Paula, yes, and from Delia, between hijo and hija, you can say criatura, which is a gender neutral kind of child. Yes, that's good. So after you have um, learned how to interpret in general, then you have to learn court interpreting well enough that you can pass a state test. Uh, it depends on the state, what percentage you have to get correctly. Um, in Texas, there's a 60% level called the basic court interpreter that has certain um, venues where you can interpret and then a 70% level in each of the modes um, so that you can be what's called here a master court interpreter. In other states, it's uh, 70 percent and 80 percent um, each state. Most states use the same exam, um, but they each set their own standards for uh, exactly what the steps are and the scores that you need to pass. But before you take the state test, they're kind of expensive. It's like uh, 100 dollars for the written and 300 for the oral in Texas, I think. And so you want to make sure that you've studied um, before you invest that kind of money. But the things that you're studying are about the legal system, how the courts work in the U.S. Um, what the legal vocabulary is that's commonly used in both languages, how to cite translate a legal document, and I'll show you an example in a minute of what that entails. Um, that's looking at a paper in one language and reading it aloud in, as if it were in the other languages. How to consecutively interpret, which is often an attorney asking questions in English and then a witness answering in Spanish, and you're going back and forth between both languages how to simultaneously interpret some speech in English, such as an attorney giving closing arguments to the jury, and you are interpreting into Spanish for the defendant who's listening. Uh, you should record, like Lorena said, record yourself and listen to yourself. And I like listening to myself the next day. After, I've, after it's not so fresh in my memory, sometimes I can be more objective about evaluating my own performance. And then find partners, try to get into a study group or join some community on WhatsApp or Facebook or at your local university or at your local professional association and get involved with other people who are doing the same thing who can help keep you motivated and, and, and um, give you feedback and share resources with you. So passing the, the state tests, a lot of people um, take about a year to do this. Some people only study uh, for six months, and then because they're already good interpreters, they're able to pass at that point. Some people study for two years, and they take the test a couple times before they pass. It all depends on um, how much time you're able to put into it and how much interpreting experience you have before you get to this point. It's hard to predict how long you'll take. The written exam, uh, everybody has to pass a written exam first. It's entirely in English, and it has questions kind of like this. There are 
135 questions. Um, and uh, a couple examples are a person who feels persecuted in his or her home country may apply for political and you have to be able to answer anybody anybody appellation appraisal asylum or ascendance asylum and the reward goes to Robbie and Paula um, and zoom user. <laughs> Uh, second example is it was done pursuant to the proceedings of the court. There'll be a word underlined and they want you to explain what that word means in accordance with. Good. Um, in addition to, in conjunction with, in spite of, are not as close. Some of them are absolutely wrong and some of them are just not as close as the best answer. So again, this test is 100% in English. There is not a single word in a foreign language on the entire written test, except Latin. There's a little bit of Latin in there because the US legal system loves Latin. But it, this is a test to see if no matter where you grew up, no matter where your education was, is your English at a high level like you would expect of a college graduate from the United States. You don't have to have a college degree from anywhere. You can just, you know, you could have dropped out of high school and still love reading and have a huge vocabulary and pass this test. But at, at any rate, you better love reading and have a huge vocabulary because this is a language job. This is a word job. We earn a living on words. And so the more words that you know, the better you'll do. And if you aren't a prolific reader now, I encourage you to take up reading as a hobby and start with John Grisham. Those are some good books to learn about uh, how the legal system works in different aspects of the law. The different categories of question on the written test are scenarios, professional conduct questions, and the blue bar shows you how heavily that's weighted on the test. So there are a few professional conduct questions, things like a court interpreter should do this and not do this in an ethical situation. There are a couple of sequence questions, such as uh, the steps in a criminal trial. First, this happens and then that happens. There are some court related questions about um, legal procedures. There's a ton of sentence completion questions like the ones we just saw where you have to fill in the blank with the best word. There's a lot of idiom questions, figures of speech, like put the pedal to the metal, raining cats and dogs. Um, and again, those are all English expressions. So it doesn't matter what the Spanish expression is at this point for the written test. Um, free rice. This is a very cool game. OK, thank you, Ines. Um, antonyms and synonyms. This word is most nearly opposite this one. This word is most nearly the same as that one. Synonyms in context and sentence completion again a different section of the sentence completion. So um, a good way to prepare for the written exam is to use study materials prepared specifically for that that you can buy online or materials like you check out from your library that are for preparing people to take advanced tests of the English language, such as the TOEFL, uh, the GRE. The GRE is a graduate exam to get into grad school or um, the SAT, the ACT, the high school exams, um, anything prepared for the English, English art section of that will help you build your English vocabulary. And then after you pass the written test, then you take the oral test. Um, a lot of people are able to pass the written test uh, with less studying um, than the oral test. The oral test generally takes a lot more work. I know in my case, I graduated from college in the US. My English is, is really good. And so I didn't have to study much for the written test, but the oral test was very challenging. And I put in hundreds of hours of practice for that. I did mostly self-study. I didn't take any, any classes for that. Um, what was your prep like for the oral test, Lorena? Um, well, I had the advantage that I, I went to law school, so um, I, the vocabulary was already there. And it, that was a big advantage, yes. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I already knew the vocabulary. So for me, it was mostly um, training my brain to learn how to interpret in simultaneous and consecutive mode, um, working on my long-term memory. Um, as you start you know, practicing for the test and for a career in interpreting, some people are better and not not necessarily mean better forever but it just it, uh, simultaneous comes easier to some people and consecutive comes easier to other people so whatever your weakness is if you have better short-term memory than long-term memory then practice more consecutive because you're going to be using more long-term memory for consecutive so for me it was that it was um um you know taking um uh classes i took uh, classes at acc acc has a program um there's uh other programs that you can take um either online or in person at different um, community colleges or universities so i started with that um and uh and yeah passed the exam in 2012 yes so wow 10 years ago <laughs>
And you are now the director of that ACC program, coincidentally, right? Yes, coincidentally, and yes, now I'm the program coordinator of the um, ACC interpreting and translating program. So, um, yeah, it's a, uh, you know, I, I don't want to sell my <laughs> my program here, but if you're looking for something that's online and it's in Austin, but it's online, that's one program. Marco is also a teacher, of, an instructor at another wonderful program that I'm sure he'll talk about, um, but there's plenty. And if you don't want to pay for a course, there's plenty of materials online. Um, that are free YouTube videos that Marco does, for example, they're excellent and others just uh, just look for anything that says how to prepare uh, for the court interpreting exam and you'll find plenty of materials online. Yeah. And the um, I find that it's possible to train for these exams without spending a penny. Uh, you can if you're really motivated and disciplined, you can find the materials to train for free. But sometimes spending a little bit of money is actually motivational. You're like, dang, I put this money into the course, I don't want it to go to, go to waste. And so that sort of pushes you to uh, work harder than you might otherwise. Uh, it's just a trick of psychology. Um, there's a question in the chat from Ines about a sequence. A sequence question might be, uh, what comes first, the arraignment or the sentencing? And you have to know that arraignment is early on in a trial process and sentencing is at the very end. And you never have a sentencing before the arraignment. You can't, you can't skip over that. And so there'll be like, a, a, B, C, and D, and each one will have those in a different order. Arraignment, um, uh, plea, uh, sentencing versus plea, arraignment, sentencing versus something else. And you have to pick the one that's in the right order. Thank you, law and order. Yeah, that's a good way to get comfortable with trial procedure. So here's an example from the oral exam. Um, after you pass a written test, then you go on to the oral test. And in Texas, for example, these are only given in Austin. In some states, there's a contractor in every major city. We used to have that here as convenient where you could go and take it from Prometric or somebody. Um, but when you take the oral exam, you're gonna sit down probably with a staff member who may not even speak your other language, but you just has a couple of tape recorders or, or digital um, uh, recorders and is pushing buttons. And when you hear it in English, you're saying it in Spanish. And when you hear it in Spanish, you're saying it in English. And that person passes you a piece of paper and so the site translation, um, there will be, in my case, it was one page in English and then one page in Spanish. And so first I look at the English page, I think about it, I figure out how I'm going to say it in Spanish, and then I start reading it aloud smoothly and evenly as if I were reading something written in Spanish. And then the same thing, I look at a Spanish page, I think about it, and then I start saying it aloud as if it were in English. And here's an example that the NCSC, the National Center for State Courts, publishes, and they're the people who create the exam and so they're really good at their free training materials you can count on them and so if it were in english this might be witness testimony i eric turner a citizen of the city who is currently living at 200 madero avenue do appear and state that i am here to file a formal complaint right away you see there's some high level legalese in here i do appear and state that i'm here to file a formal complaint this isn't the kind of language you use at home hanging out with your cousins this is stuff that you would hear in a courtroom and so you have to come up with Spanish that is at a similar, not exactly, but a similar level of formality and complexity. And you want to make sure that every word is as close as you can get in Spanish to the English original, because you don't know which ones are underlined. This is sort of the answer key here. The ones that are in black, uh, bold, underlining with the number are called the scoring units. And the person who listens to your recording gives you the grade is only gonna grade you on the word you chose for citizen, on the phrase you chose for living at, on the word you chose for appear, on the word you chose for against, on the word you chose for crime, and they're going to pretty much ignore the rest. They want it to be consistent and they want it to flow smoothly, but you're actually getting points for just those key words and you don't know as a tester which ones are the scoring units. And so you have to do all every word in there as close as you can. And there are, there are different ways to render it. Right now, if I ask Lorena, I'm not going to put you on the spot, Lorena, yeah, I know you'd do great if I did, but if I asked her to um, read this aloud in Spanish and then I read it aloud in Spanish, we would use different words. We would choose different renderings and um, they would not sound the same. And that's okay because anything that you say, any sentence in English, there's at least 10 different correct ways to say that in Spanish. And you can put words in a different order. You can choose different synonyms. And on the test, they would they would be counted right as long as in any dialect of Spanish, they are considered a close enough equivalent by the exam graders. Um, yes, Delia, for appear in court, I use presentarse or comparecer. Those are both good. Uh, just one thing on, on that, I'm gonna add 
something one of the things that they trick you in these exams because they always have the little tricks for example up here if you would use aparecer and not comparecer that would be wrong because it's a false cognate and you don't appear like poof <laughs> right and, and that's what aparecer means in spanish so you have to be very careful with those falsos amigos with those false cognates um, there's plenty of correct ways to say it and there's usually a few incorrect ways to say it right so for uh, appear aparecer Nope, that's going to be, that's not going to um, give you, that's going to, they're going to take a point off for that one. So. Right. Thank you. And number five, they're probably listening to see if you say crimen. A uh, crimen is not a good Spanish choice in this context because a crimen is, is a more serious kind of crime in, cri in English crimes is any level. And so probably the best choice would be delito. Um, and later on, you see that it's a traffic accident and a traffic accident. I don't think in any Spanish speaking country would be called a crimen. You know, that's like a, a murder or something, uh, a serious felony. And so those uh, those shades of meaning between different synonyms can uh, trip you up. And it's the kind of thing a training program will help you get comfortable with. The simultaneous mode is the next section on the oral exam. And here's an, again an NCSC practice script. And in this case, you would not be looking at the text. In the previous one, you wouldn't be looking at that text either. No, you would. That was the site. But um, for the simultaneous, you're not looking at any text. You're just listening on headphones. And somebody pretending to be an attorney is reading the script. And you're listening to it. And um, because this is simultaneous interpretation, you are, after each sentence or partway through each sentence, you're just going to jump in and start saying in Spanish whatever you heard in English. And as you're training for simultaneous, you'll learn some techniques to do this accurately. It's, it's challenging. It's not a natural human function. Nobody is born being a good simultaneous interpreter. You have, to, you have to train for it. But there are ways to listen and reorganize, reformulate, and then speak and um, try to uh, move things around into the right place if the syntax or the word order is different between your two languages. And again, the underlying words, you don't know as a test taker, which ones are the scoring units, but the scorer will be looking especially at what you use for opening statement. They wanna hear a high level legal term in Spanish or your other language, a burden of proof, that's another legal term of art. So they'll be looking for something that an attorney might say in a Spanish speaking country, prosecution, um, for the date, September 8th, 2020, they just want to make sure you get that date right and don't mix it up and say like uh, September 20th, uh, 2008 or something. Um, anytime you hear a number, 3.55 p.m., the number will probably be a scoring unit because it's easy to mess up on numbers. And so as you're listening, uh, you'll have uh, paper and pen in front of you. And I always jot down any numbers that I hear, any dates. And if they give the name of a person, then I'll put at least the first couple of letters of the person's name to... to Try to hold on to that abstract fact a little bit longer before it slips out of my working memory. Uh, Lorena, any comment about simultaneous before I go on to consecutive? Uh, no, simultaneous, just one trick for the exam, not necessarily in your uh, working in simultaneous and in your, you know, as an interpreter, as a professional interpreter. But if there's something, a term you don't know, skip it, keep going, because uh, if you get stuck on a word, then you're going to miss, uh, you know, half of the recording. And so yeah. then you won't be able to catch up. So don't, don't, if you don't know opening statement, just skip, continue on, because you don't know where the scoring units are, correct? So, um, so you're better off, uh, you, you have better chances if you just continue than getting stuck on a word and missing two or three sentences where that were heavy on scoring units. Yeah, and I, I hear so many of my students come out of the test saying, I froze up because there was this one word I didn't know. And then I, then I sort of blanked out and freaked out and, and lost the next paragraph after that. So a lot of passing this test, it, I mean, you have to have the skills going in, but a lot of it is just psychological. You have to be prepared. You have to learn how to calm down and have confidence in yourself and understand how to handle mistakes and how to keep on going. In, in real life, if you freaked out and you didn't hear a bunch of stuff, you could, you could interrupt the hearing theoretically um, and say, I need you to repeat that. And then they would repeat it. But on the test, there's you're allowed to do that like only twice. And then after that, they cut you off. And so you have to understand those rules before you go in. Then the consecutive is the, is the third of the three modes on the oral test. And this is an example, not from the NCSC, but from the state of California that I found online in English. And I translated the Spanish answers so that it would reflect the English-Spanish format. Again, you're not looking at any text in this mode, but you are listening to 
somebody impersonating an attorney speak the English lines and then you're pausing it and you're saying in Spanish what you just heard and then you're hearing somebody else saying the Spanish line and then you pause it and you say in English what you just heard. And this will be a um, probably a longer section because there's more pauses going on, but there will be the same kind of challenge with scoring units. If there's a date in there or an address in there um, or somebody's name, that's probably going to be a scoring unit, but then there will be other uh, legal terms or colloquialisms or maybe uh, profanity that will probably be scoring units too because they want to make sure that you get those details right. And the reason profanity comes up a lot is because if somebody's talking about an argument and they quote what the other person said and it's a really bad word, then the jury understands, oh, that was very offensive. I understand why that led to a fight. But if they say a, ver a word that you interpret as a very mild word like uh, dummy or or fool, you know, if you tone it down because you're embarrassed to say the bad words, then the jury will think, well, that's not a very bad word. I don't, I don't know why you got upset about that. And it changes the whole dynamic of the, the judgment of, of the event if you don't uh, try to match the emotional feel of the original language. So, um, Lorena, any comments about consecutive? Um, another thing that I've noticed in the state and the federal exams that um, usually is a scoring unit is the the hesitations like the hmm, well, uh, you, you know, you might think it's not important to um, to say those, but you have to interpret accurately and completely and completely means interpreting those words too. And it's also because those can show a certain amount of hesitation or, you know, on the part of the, the defendant or the witness in this case. So it is important. So don't omit those. Um, if, if it's a, uh, well, um, yesterday, it's bueno, pues, uh, ayer, just don't omit those because it could be scoring units, okay? Oh, yeah. Or if the witness says something like, okay, so maybe I did kill him. I mean, I mean, of course I didn't kill him. That You have to make sure that you say that whole thing, <laughs> the, the part that he corrected and the part that he, he wanted to say, because if he were speaking English, everyone in the room would have heard both parts of the statement, so you can't clean it up and, and smooth it out for the, the person in the other language. All right, so that is what the consecutive looks like. And Lorena, you reminded me that we've been talking all just about the court level, uh, the state level courts here so far, um, but you pass the state level exams and then the federal exams. Is the federal exam kind of like the state exam, just more challenging? Um, it's a little bit more challenging and also the score is 80%. Um, so most people, I would say 99% of the people, they pass the state exams first, uh, regardless of the state, could be any state. And then they work as an interp as interpreters for a number of years and then then you're ready to pass the federal exam. The federal exam, I think um, uh, the passing rate is typically about 4% for the oral. So it, it is not an easy test. Um, but I think that to prepare for the federal uh, exam, the best way to do it is just to obviously, you know, already be working as an interpreter, which means you had to pass the state exam first. So if none of you are state certified yet or state licensed, as we call them in Texas, focus on that. And then eventually you might want to go on, you know, and try the federal exam um, to work in federal courts. Yeah. And and the federal exam currently is just being given in Spanish, right? Uh, correct. It used to be um, Spanish, uh, Navajo, and French Creole, and now it's only Spanish, sadly. So, yes. And it's not even given every year. It's uh, just now and it's, then it's offered. <laughs> it's every two years, and they hadn't had it since COVID, and they just had it uh, about a month and a half ago. So, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So, uh, we are going to be focusing all of, all of today is mostly about the state exam because that's the, the entry point into court interpreting. Um, all right, so marketing your services. Once you get the credential, you get this uh, letter in the mail and it's like one of the best days of your life because um, whatever state you're in has just sent you some kind of card. The Texas one looks like this. I've got it in my little wallet here, my ID wallet. And they never ask you to see it. I've had, in all the years I've been doing this, I think I've had maybe one court reporter ask me to see the card. No judge has ever asked to see it. It's not like you, you have to present it, but um, some places they like you to uh, display a credential when you're going into the courthouse. So that may apply in your, in your state or your jurisdiction, but you become an entrepreneur. Basically you now have like having a driver's license, you're not allowed to drive, but that doesn't mean anybody's gonna give you a car or pay for your gas. It just means that you now have the right to drive. And so you have to get out there and find the work. You have to get out and let people know I am a Spanish court interpreter or whatever. 
and I'm available for work, and this is how much I charge, and this is my cancellation policy, and this is the area that I cover, and this is how much uh, advance notice I need, and here's how to get a hold of me. And so that involves, in the beginning, you spend more time marketing than you actually do interpreting. And then ideally, over the course of the first couple of years, you build up your client base and you convince people that you're reliable and that you can do a good job. And then they keep calling you and they refer other people to you. But it involves um, starting out, you work in a lot of assignments, um, maybe not the most lucrative assignments or the most appealing ones. It might be the kind of work that your other colleagues don't like doing because there's something unpleasant about that type of case or that location. Uh, you join associations. Uh, NAJIT is our National Association of Judiciary Interpreters and Translators. And whatever region you live in, there's probably a state or a metro area association that you can join. Meeting colleagues there is a good way to get referred uh, jobs and to just have somebody to ask questions. Hey, um, what, what is it like working in this particular county or who do I need to talk to at this courthouse? You need to develop an online presence that's credible, probably starting with LinkedIn, a LinkedIn profile that looks professional, uh, that has your picture because people are going to see your face when you interpret anyways, and so you want them to be able to recognize you. Uh, eventually, you figure out who your ideal clients are and how to keep them coming back for more and how to steer less favorable clients away from you, how to <laughs> pass them off to somebody else. Um, over delivering to earn repeat business. Uh, Lorena, can you explain to me what it means to over deliver as an interpreter? Uh, well, over deliver means you're going to be there, you know, fifth, at least 15 minutes earlier, you are going to be dressed professionally, um, you are going to do the best job that you can, uh, if you have your own equipment, you're going to bring your own equipment and, and use your equipment, if the court's going to provide the equipment or the client at the deposition, make sure you're there on time so you can test it. Um, and just, you know, look professional, we are professionals and, um, you know, the way we portray ourselves. And is you know not only you know will bring you more customers, but it also reflects on the entire profession. Um, so be punctual. Don't double book yourself. Um, you know if for some reason I mean things happen, you might have to cancel. Make sure that you have a network of colleagues and coworkers that you can say, hey, could you cover this for me last minute? Don't let people hanging um, because you know your reputation is everything as a freelancer. Um, the word you know especially in in Central Texas, which is where I've worked as a freelance interpreter. It's a very um, close knit community of interpreters. And, uh, you know, when people, you know, <laughs> if, if you don't show up, if you show up late, if you are incompetent when you're interpreting, people will know, right? So they will not call you. Uh, on the flip side, as soon as you get your license, go introduce yourself to all the court reporters that you can, to all the courtroom deputies, go to Hayes County, Travis County, whatever counties are around there, and, um, and, and just give them your card, you know, spend some money and you can do your card online through, you know, a bunch Vista of different print. websites. Uh, yeah, Vistaprint, um, you know, give your card and um, yeah, sell your services. Yeah. And a lot of what you do as an entrepreneur is in common with other freelance entrepreneurs in other industries. You know, whatever a realtor does or an architect does or a contractor does to try to drum up business, we do similar things just in the legal sphere. And every initial contact, you want to make a good impression. Usually the first contact is by email. So make sure you have a, a legit looking email address that's professional and not silly. Make sure you have a signature line in the bottom saying something like your name and licensed court interpreter or certified court interpreter or Spanish interpreter and translator and just uh, proofread all your emails. If you have errors, in, if you're, even if English isn't your first language and you send somebody an email, make sure that somebody else proofreads it to make sure the English is perfect because you're selling your language services and so you want your language to be excellent in every context. And there are people who will judge you if you make a mistake, even though it's your second language, and will say, well, if this person can't even write a good email, I don't think I'm going to trust her to interpret in a high stakes uh, trial. And so right there, you, you have, uh, you've closed the door. Uh, question from Mary Diaz in the chat. Uh, she took the oral test on October 6th. Yes, uh, you should receive uh, an email. It depends on what state you're in, but you should receive an email and then probably a paper letter too from the state um, about your score. Sometimes it takes a couple months to get that, which is always frustrating, that long, long wait. So this is the last slide here. These are just some surprises. When I was a young interpreter, I remember um, 
that half of the time my assignments canceled. People a couple of days before were like, oh, never mind, he pled out, meaning the defendant um, decided not to go to trial. And so there will be no trial, you're not needed anymore. Or um, some, some party in a deposition wasn't available and they, they had to postpone it. Um, so those freelance assignments can cancel. And if it's within your window, you can charge a cancellation fee, but that has to be something they've agreed on in advance. A lot of interpreters say, if it cancels 24 hours out, you still have to pay me this much money to cover my loss of income from not being able to rebook. Um, I, I have a three business day cancellation policy, which a lot of clients don't like, but I don't like them canceling the last day. <laughs> and so as a freelancer, you can set your own terms. Almost none of your work as a court interpreter is an actual trial like you would picture on TV with a jury and a crowd of people. It's usually in little hearings with just a judge and an attorney or two and an offendant or maybe two parents standing before a judge, smaller settings that are shorter, half an hour long or something. Uh, you spend most of your time in court not interpreting. Sometimes you'll be in court the whole day and you won't say a single word. You'll just be sitting there waiting for your case to be called and answering email and maybe reading something in your lap and they'll never call you and then you're done, but you still get paid because you were there as scheduled. And so you send in your invoice and a month later, a check comes in the mail and you get paid for doing nothing. You get paid for being available because it wasn't your fault that they didn't need you after all. Um, you get paid for cancellations if they're within your window. A lot of judges, I would say, especially in certain areas that uh, most people speak English and they don't get a lot of cases in other languages, the judge and the attorneys will have no idea who you are, what you do, how it works, and you'll have to sort of teach them, explain, okay, this is what we're going to do. You're going to just talk to the defendant in English as if he were listening to you. Don't talk to me. I'm just going to stand off here to the side and you explain, and then you have to remind them as it goes on. You don't address me as the interpreter. I'm just sort of invisible. You talk to each other, and then I pass the messages back and forth for you. And sometimes they, they get it right away. Usually they're good hearted people who will do their best to do it the right way. Um, but sometimes it takes a little while for them to get used to it. And often they'll be frustrated by the interruption because they're not used to having all these interruptions. They just want to get on with business and they'll have to downshift uh, and, and get used to going through the interpreter. And uh, when you interpret something new, like the very first time in juvenile court, or the very first time in divorce court, there will be all kinds of new procedures and terminology that you have to learn and it will be stressful and it will be hard. But then the second time it's twice as easy because you've heard all this before. And then the third time you're like, oh, piece of cake, I've got this because I'm familiar with this uh, setting. And so each different aspect of the law has its own um, obstacles to learn. And that's part of the fun is learning how to perform in this type of court versus that type of court. And everyone's scared at the beginning, um, and that goes away with time, just like uh, any new job, any new high stakes job, it uh, is challenging, but you get used to it and then it becomes a lot of fun. So these are some suggestions for where to go from here. If this sounds like something you'd like to try, um, the NCSC has a website with lots of free study materials. And I will send out these PowerPoints, by the way, to everybody who signed up, you don't have to write all these down. Um, your state will have probably court interpreter web pages. There are self-study materials you can order from companies like Acebo. That's one of the famous ones. There are classes you can take at colleges like ACC or UT. You should definitely visit courthouses. They're open to the public and you should sit in on all kinds of different hearings and just ask yourself, how would I say that in Spanish if I were the interpreter here and take lots of notes? And you should put study goals on your calendar. I think every morning, if you're trying to become a court interpreter, you should be spending, get up half an hour early every morning and spend that time on focused study. Uh, half an hour again at lunchtime, if you can afford it and put in daily regular time, just like you're training for a, an athletic event because you have to exercise that brain. So I'm gonna go through the questions now. Um, before I start reading these, Lorena, do you have anything that you were about to say? Um, no, just one one thing um, that the court because the, it's a career in such hard demand and such high demand. Um, interpreters are very supportive of each other. We we really we we send work when we can't take it and everything. So again, your reputation is everything. One thing that I don't recommend that you do when you start as an interpreter, if the average uh, rate of pay is let's say um, eighty dollars an hour for a beginning interpreter, don't go ahead and start and say, "Hey, I'll do it for thirty, right? Because again, uh, you might get that job, but 
you're not helping the profession, right? Because one day you're going to want to get paid 100. And if people are taking jobs for 30, <laughs> then you're not helping anyone. So I know you're going to be eager, but also take into account that you're not getting paid by the hour that you work. You're getting paid for all the money you spent on materials, on courses, on time that you spent studying. So you're getting paid for that. You are a professional. So don't undersell yourself because you're not doing yourself a favor and you're not doing the whole profession a favor. You'll have plenty of work and you will end up getting paid $100 an hour. I mean, I can't guarantee it, but yes, you know, um, that's, that's the norm around, around Texas. So. Right. Though, though we're not, we're not allowed to say you should charge as much. There, mm -hmm. there are rules from the federal trade commission or somebody um, yeah, yeah. that in a freelance market, everybody has the freedom. You have the right to charge what you want. Mm 